Hello, I'm Mr. Eliasson, and welcome to APUSH. Today we're going to discuss attempts to reform society within the Gilded Age, as more and more reformers recognized and tried to address the problems that we've laid out in the past seven lessons. So we're going to take a look at the barriers to reform, some of the attempts to push to reform it, the rise of mass media, and then we're going to look at uh, to the extent to which these reforms were successful. And uh, spoiler alert, if you know anything about the Gilded Age, it's going to go about as well as you expected. So, some things that we see happening during the Gilded Age. We talked in previous lessons about the rise of the penny press and the creation of mass media. The penny press was a very cheap way of producing newspapers that really arose before the Civil War, but it helps explain why newspapers became so readily available during this time period, and especially their growth in the Gilded Age, as we started to get the arrival of the daily newspaper and sometimes the twice daily newspaper. No longer would people have to wait for a period of time before the news was being presented to them. Instead, they could read the news the day it happened or potentially the day after or even events during the day. They could read the evening newspaper in order to hear the latest sort of updates on the things, the uh, important events that were occurring. And so this leads to a much more informed populace and really makes newspapership into big business as the demand for more information continues to grow and as a variety of different innovators arise to fill the space demanding more advanced uh, technology or sorry more advanced information. We see the variety of a whole bunch of different newspapers and also monthly magazines. For example, Harper's becomes a very popular monthly magazine, sort of dealing with all sorts of different uh, sort of things of popular interest. Ladies Home Journal focuses on sort of interest stuff that they thought uh, women's would be women would be interested in during the time. And Puck Magazine is an American political satirical magazine focusing on little anecdotes, political cartoons, things like that. And so all of these help contribute to Americans' broader understanding of the world that they live in and significantly greater access to information. We also see the rise of Puck Magazine came up with the first emojis, which I find awesome. So here they are. What does this tell us? What's the purpose of this? Pure entertainment. And so another portion of the newspaper, the growth of the newspaper and mass media industry, is it understood that its goal was not just to inform, but also to sell itself. And so they choose to focus on things that are funny, things that they think are important, and they develop new techniques to try to bring in viewers. The circulation wars between Joseph Pulitzer on the right and William Randolph Hearst on the left significantly increased newspaper readership as both of these media moguls attempted to revolutionize the newspaper industry and the news industry by bringing in a variety of new innovations, fighting over writers and content, and trying to uh, compete directly against each other. Specifically, Hearst, who was based out of San Francisco, attempted to move into the New York media market, which was dominated by Pulitzer, kicking off the circulation wars. In order to try to get more, in order to try to get more readers, Hearst brought in innovations for his New York Evening Journal, like the headline, these sort of large uh, text, bold, you know, topics for, uh, p for stories. They both brought in pictures. They brought in sort of branding and, uh, and things like that. And in an attempt to try to grab viewers' eyes and sell more newspapers. Writers like Nellie Bly were also able to compete as, uh, as they went out and created content. So the battle over you know, the rights to this various content became very important. So take a moment and read Nellie Bly's Around the World in 72 Days, which clearly lays out her ability to sort of uh, leverage her readability and her popularity to make sure that she could get uh, more viewership. So pause. And the arrival of the comic strip, especially the famous Yellow Kid, which when it was uh, when it moved from the world to the Evening Journal, significantly increased Hearst's readership. Here you can see uh, the Yellow Kid is a hilarious story about an orphaned kid living on the streets of New York City and his various adventures and misadventures. Uh, as a as a spoil as a you know a warning for everybody, if you go out and search the Yellow Kid, they get spectacularly racist. So yeah, just be aware of that. Here's the yellow kid. It's hilarious. Look, he's, he's scared by a flower. And there's a cat. Oh, who? What's not to like? 
here's Pulitzer laying out his basic vision. And uh, there is so it's and uh, the basic takeaway from this is it's not just sort of making money. I mean, it is about making money, but there's an also an element of altruism here as far as shedding light on issues in order to try to both engage viewers and also try to move society forward. And so there is some measure of altruism in these media moguls, especially as we get into muckraking. Muckraking is a specific type of investigative journalism in which the journalist goes out in order to write exposés about issues that are important at the time to raise public awareness of the issue and to advocate for change and progress. So, for example, Ida Wells Barnett, who we, re who we read some earlier, wrote a lot about lynching in the southern states in order to draw attention to that. Ida Tarbell famously took on Standard Oil and tried to lay out sort of the corrupt practices of Standard Oil in order to try to bring uh, Rockefeller low. Jacob Rees, in his, uh, his, his both his, uh, his photo expose and some of his writings, wrote How the Other Half Lives, demonstrating sort of the poverty of urban workers in order to try to advocate for change. And Nellie Bly, also went into, uh, went into facilities that dealt with people with mental illness in order to lay out sort of the horrible treatment of people within asylums. Sort of similar to what Dorothy Dix did back in the second Great Awakening. So take a moment, pause, it's pretty awful. And of course, the goal of these muckrakers, as we talked about before, is to advocate and push for change. Not just but, they also get viewers, and so they're very popular, they get readers. As far as reformers go, we see uh, various authors trying to push for a better world. Edward Bellamy is a pioneer of sort of utopian science fiction with his story Looking Backwards about how we were able to finally improve our lives and uh, not live in the industrial hellscape that the Gilded Age had become. It focuses mostly on how perfect this utopian future is going to be and much less on the process of how we're going to get there. The social gospel is the idea that, similar to the Second Great Awakening, that Protestants should try to push to make the world a better place. And so we start to see a rise in zeal for reform as middle class Protestants now have more money and more ability to sort of donate to things that are important to them. And so there's this push to reform society, not just because Jesus is going to come back and we want to live in his thousand year kingdom, but also because, you know, Jesus also had some stuff to say about helping the poor that, you know, is pretty straightforward. Jane Addams was one of the pioneers of the settlement house movement, which creates uh, community centers in urban areas to try to help provide a greater social safety net and greater community sort of cohesion that often gets lost in sort of the impersonality of large urban settings. We also get the push for greater public goods, you know, better roads, better sanitation systems, better sewer systems, uh, the creation of these beaches, which apparently people can just go and swim and there's like then they're for fun or playgrounds where apparently children just go and play and don't work in a factory. It's very confusing how all of this works, but yeah. And so the push for the creation of these public goods improves American lives and provides more outlets for leisure and things like that. Probably the most famous American reformer that you've never heard of is Henry George, whose book Progress and Poverty basically accuses speculation of causing all sort of governmental problem, all uh, economic problems, and basically argues that greater government intervention is necessary to stamp out speculation and get things back to fairer prices. He was incredibly widely read during the time period, although he generally gets lost in most surveys of economic thinkers because nothing came from his, his uh, writings at the time. We, get the, we also get the rise of socialists. Uh, the International Working Men's Organization has already, or the Communist International, as it becomes known, has already met. Uh, Karl Marx and Frederick Engels have already written their Communist Manifesto. Mikhail Bakunin is already advocating for anarcho-socialism. And so we're starting to see these movements show up in the United States. We talked last time about the Haymarket Riot, where uh, an anarcho-socialist threw a bomb killing police officers. But it's not just anarcho-terrorism that dominates philosophy. We also start to see, again, the writings of people like Engels. So take a minute, pause, make sure you understand the basic principles of communism here. And we get groups like the International Workers of the World who are trying to politically organize in order to make this happen. 
As you hopefully remember from world history, one of the key divides between the communists and the socialists is the communists were trying to work within sort of established structures to take control of government in order to push communism, whereas the, the anarchists were trying to convince people that they need to ignore government and sort of go back to basic living in basic supportive communes in order to usher in socialism. So the IWW falls much more into the communist area uh, with organizers like Mother Jones here. The IWW uh, tries to organize workers into one massive union. Of course, we tossed la talked last time about how that is often difficult because the interests of workers often don't necessarily align with each other. And so it's, it's very difficult to get all specially skilled and unskilled workers on the same page. But the IWW attempted to do this, and it was popular, especially amongst unskilled workers and recent immigrants. And many segments of American society found them menacing and terrifying. And once we start getting to our red scares, the IWW is going to be cracked down on pretty hard by the powers that be. As far as actual government regulation of big business, we are going to see some. You hopefully remember that the Interstate Commerce Act was passed under the Cleveland administration to try to regulate railroad rates, but it sort of failed to do so. We also had the Pendleton Civil Service Act under the Arthur administration, which attempted to uh, get rid of the patronage system and also didn't totally succeed. And so here we've got under the second, under the Harrison administration, we have the Sherman Antitrust Act, which was an attempt to rein in monopolies. The problem with the Sherman Antitrust Act, as you should pause and read here, is that it is somewhat vague as far as both what a monopoly is and then also the punishments are somewhat uh, underwhelming. And so trying to find John D. Rockefeller $5,000 is equivalent to mostly a slap on the wrist. And in general, the government continued to support monopolists by using the Sherman Antitrust Act to break up unions, strikes, and workers, arguing that these illegal combinations of workers constituted a, quote, monopoly of labor. So in general, you really didn't see much use of the Sherman Antitrust Act, at least not in the way that its authors intended it during this time period. But like all the other reforms passed during the Gilded Age, these reforms are important because they set the groundwork that could be used if we ever got, you know, a vigorous executive who was interested in wielding like a big stick to bash down what he saw as some of the problems with society. So we'll save that for next unit. In reality, the one case or the most famous case brought by through the Sherman Antitrust Act was EC Knight was a United States versus EC Knight company. Uh, E.C. Knight had uh, monopolized 98% monopolized of the sugar refining business in the United States. And so it seemed pretty clear that that would be a monopoly and that we should be able to break it up. Unfortunately, it said that although the Sherman Antitrust Act was constitutional, manufacturing is not commerce, and refining sugar is not a violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act because it doesn't involve interstate commerce. And so also sugar being a non-essential, we're not going to deal with it. And so in reality, the Sherman Antitrust Act was not effective during this time period in breaking up monopolies because if you can't break up a refining company that controls 98% of the sugar refining, you're pretty much screwed. So here's United States versus E.C. Knight Company. Here's the second Cleveland administration being uh, chained to the Sugar Trust. We haven't talked about second Cleveland yet, but we will. And so monopolies continue to reign supreme and government regulation not super effective. So that'll wrap this up for today. For when we come back next time, we'll talk about the rise of nativism and or new nativism, I should say, as we bring in new and different groups of immigrants who are terrifying because just like the previous groups of immigrants, they are so different from, from your average sort of white Anglo-Saxon Protestant Americans that there's no possible way that they can be integrated into society. And so we're going to have to talk about a variety of different potential solutions to this ever-present problem. Thank you for listening.